and welcome. Uh, welcome to our second lecture for this semester. Um, may I remind you, the session is being recorded, um, and so is the discussion later, and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and Facebook page, where you can already find the recordings of our previous lectures. Um, today, it is my honor to present Professor Walter Paul from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Professor Paul specializes in the history of late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. His vast scholarship has made immense contribution to our understanding of historiography, ethnogenesis, and identity formation during the migration period and the transformation of the Roman world at large, spanning from Western Europe to the Eurasian steppe and even the Muslim world. Until very recently, Professor Paul had been the director of the Institute for Medieval Research of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He is a fellow of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the Academia Europea, and Emeritus Professor of Medieval History at the University of Vienna. Among many awards and honors, Professor Paul was awarded the Wittgenstein Prize of the Austrian um, Science Fund, the ERC Advanced Grant for the project Social Cohesion, Identity and Religion in Europe 400 to 1200. He led the HERA project, Cultural Memory and Resources of the Past 8400 to 1000, and currently acts as co-principal investigator of the Histogenes Project, integrating genetic, archaeological, and historical perspectives on Eastern Central Europe, 400 to 900 AD, along with professors Patrick Geary, Johannes Kauser, and Tivita Vida. Professor Paul's numerous publications include, among really countless others, um, The Transformation of Frontiers from Late Antiquity to the Carolingians, Regna and Gentes, the relationship between late antique and early medieval peoples and kingdoms in the transformation of the Roman world, and the Avars, a steppe empire in Central Europe, 567 to 822. Today, Professor Paul uh, will talk to us about Huns and Avars in the Eurasian context. Um, as usual, we will take questions after the lecture. So if you wish to ask a question, please send me your name or questions if you prefer me to ask it. Uh, now, without further ado, Professor Paul, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Shaha, for the invitation, of course. It's a great honor um, um, and um, for the introduction. Um, and um, it's not a big surprise that I'm going um, to talk about Avars and also about Hans. Um, um, people know that I've um, dealt with this um, for a while. Um, and uh, give you a kind of mixture of um, a bit of basic narrative, a bit of big issues, and some new exciting results. Um, so um, the Eurasian steppes cover a relatively narrow stretch of the Eurasian landmass, which, however, extends over thousands of miles from the hearts of China to the heart of Central Europe arguably almost to Vienna um, from where I'm talking to you. Um, especially in Central Asia, um, they are a difficult environment for which um, nomadic pastoralism for a long time was the only feasible way of life. Societies that specialized in this challenging form of existence usually also um, developed extraordinary military skills especially as mounted warriors who were unequaled in combat with bow and arrow. Although the green band across Eurasia on this map may remind you of the Silk Road, most of um, its stretches um, actually ran further south through mountains, deserts, and oasis towns, often, however, under the control of steppe warriors. Um, what we are, of course, um, largely um, missing in the period between the fourth and the eighth centuries, when Huns and Avars lived in Europe, are written testimonies of the European steppe peoples themselves. This con contrasts with the rich information we get from the runic and sometimes also Chinese inscription on the funerary stelae of Turkic kargans and nobles from the seventh and eighth centuries. This one carries the account of the rule of Bilge Kagan from the second um, Turk Kaganate. We come back to him later. Um, in Europe, we only have scant remains of literacy in the steppe empires, 
One example are the short inscriptions in runes and in Greek on the notch St. Miklos treasure um, in Vienna Kunsthistorische Museum. Um, the inscriptions are hard to decipher. We have alternative readings um, by the leading Hungarian specialists, Andras, Ronatos, and Istvan Rajari in Turkic or in Mongolian respectively. So maybe they're also too easy to decipher. Um, the, in Europe, we only have the, um, um, the, only the Bulgars have left us a number of inscriptions. The earliest one is carved into a rock face at Madara in the early eighth century as a reminder of the um, deeds of Khan Tervel, recalling Sasanian, but also Turkish models. On the whole, therefore, we have to rely on outside reports for the history of the Danubian steppe peoples. Um, in many respects, the outside sources are influenced by prejudices or specific intentions, which may color their narratives about steppe peoples. However, Romans, Byzantines, or Franks could not afford to be badly informed about the power structures of realms that were at least potentially dangerous enemies. Much of what we hear about Hans and Evers relies on um, diplomatic and military reports, such as the famous passages by Priscus about his missions to uh, Attila, or the detailed reports about the Avar wars of the 580s and 590s that Theophilactus Simocates obviously took from a campaign diary. One advantage of the European steppe is that it offers by far the most extensive archaeological record um, in um, all of the steppe, providing us with a vivid image of the funerary representation of steppe riders. Um, here you see one nice example of uh, an Ava warrior buried with his um, horse um, somewhere in Hungary, and um, of their interaction with other groups of population. The archaeological remains of the Avar period in East Central Europe are approaching the impressive number of about 100,000 inhumations excavated. Um, while we only have a handful of graves so far that can be attributed to the Central Asian predecessors, the Roran. However, although smaller in number, Central Asian archaeology of the period has already recovered much more spectacular funerary monuments and also cities under the dominion of steppe riders, cultural idioms so far unknown from um, the Han and Ava realms. Now it has become possible to also use genetic evidence, and that is the goal of our histogenes project um, that Shaha already mentioned, funded by an ERC synergy grant from 2020 to 2026, with um, a lot of international um, participation um, and um, an interdisciplinary um, team working at it. The case study um, is um, the population history of Eastern Central Europe um, in the fifth to ninth century, which is also, I think, of high methodological um, relevance for um, the um, so far a bit difficult um, collaboration between geneticists on the one side and archaeologists and historians on the other side. Um, because um, it is the region in Europe with most population shifts, migrations, um, um, uh, two dozen of um, ethnonyms um, in the written record and um, then of the, the exceptional wealth of burial evidence, um, so many names, uh, Pannonians, Romans, Goths, Huns, uh, Longobards, Skepids, Avars, Bulgars, Slavs, Franks, and many more. So if um, you want um, to see um, what um, migrations um, leave um, in the biological record, in the genes um, of the population, um, this is an interesting example um, to try um, um, to see um, um, what was the impact of these migrations on, on the ground and all, all the different um, kingdoms um, that were erected in the period where these just sort of small groups of warriors passing through essentially um, and uh, there was a basic population that survived um, or um, did this all change? Um, so um, we're going to um, analyze um, over 6,000 ancient genomes from over 100 cemeteries. Um, that's uh, 
um, has um, the, the exact uh, list has of course um, changed a bit, um, but um, we've made um, amazing progress so far. Um, the right image is um, what you actually have to do. Um, you have to um, get um, some milligrams of bone powder extracted from the petrous bone, which is the densest bone in the body. Um, and uh, we have um, so far sampled 4,721 individuals um, and um, actually sequenced uh, more than half of the 6,000 um, that we're planning um, to analyze. Um, and these are numbers that were totally inconceivable um, even um, a few years ago. Um, so the progress of um, the technology and also of um, bioinformatics has made this possible. Um, I will come back to some of the results later um, um, and um, go on to the first parts, which is about the Huns and their Central Asian background. Um, so around the time when the first emperor, Jin Shi Huangdi, um, um, 221 to 210 BCE, and after him the Han dynasty, established the first um, unified Chinese empire, the Xiongnu under the Shan Yu, that was the ruler's title, Modun, formed the first formidable steppe empire at its northwestern frontiers in 209 BCE. Scholars mostly pictured this as a reaction to the Chinese development, but Nicola di Cosmo has argued that we should not underestimate the internal dynamic of the steppe society in the process. Here are a few of these Xiongnu. The relationship between the Chinese and the Xiongnu went through different stages and can in many respects serve as a model for later relations with between sedentary empires, also the Romans and Byzantines, and steppe realms. The Chinese built large uh, defensive structures and sought to contain Xiongnu attacks in border areas. For some time, they paid regular tributes and tried to pacify the Xiongnu by gifts, marriage alliances, and cultural influence. At the time, they also launched successful counterattacks. And they increasingly hired Xiongnu warriors and groups into their own army. The Xiongnu power subsisted longer than most other steppe realms in the history of Central Asia, fell apart and then um, collapsed um, in the first to second century CE. But the Xiongnu warlords in Chinese service profited from the dissolution of the Han Empire soon after. Some of them carved out their own realms on Chinese territory in the fourth century in the so-called 16 kingdoms period, using Chinese administrators and forms of legitimation. Um, otherwise, little was heard of Xiongnu or of Hans until the mid fourth century, um, um, whether or not um, that's um, the same thing. Um, I'm not going to go into this debate here. Um, and um, in the mid fourth century, Huns under uh, various names appeared um, in the south of Central Asia, um, in Sogdiana and Bactria, um, um, to the north of the Sasanian Empire. Qunites, Akran, Kidarite Huns um, uh, in Bactria and northwestern India, mainly attested through numismatic evidence. Here you see a few nice ones. In the fifth century, the Heftalites or White Huns became the dominate, dominant power along the northeastern frontier of the Sasanian Empire. Obviously, the movement of a group of Huns to Europe in circa 375 can be seen in that context. So where the European Huns descended from the Xiongnu, already the Guinea in the 18th century put forward this hypothesis, and we're still debating it. Um, just a, a note of caution um, to all these beautiful maps from the internet that I'm going to show. Um, um, they're actually quite nice, but they have all these um, linear frontiers, which are, um, of course, uh, very imaginative. So don't believe the um, boundaries, just use them um, to orient yourselves. Um, there are some features that might suggest the connection between the Xiongnu and European Huns, uh, most notably the bronze cauldrons often used in a funerary ritual. That is an example from the Xiongnu. And um, here are two um, exemplars from um, found um, in and around the Carpathian Basin in the Han period. Um, 
And another feature are the elongated skulls um, that um, you find on some of the um, coins um, in Bactria. This is um, King um, Kingula. Um, and um, this is a, 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 um, a skull found uh, in Eastern Austria. Um, so artificially elongated and deformed um, skulls um, have um, often been regarded as a Han characteristic. But of course, they're not particular for the Huns only. Burgundians, Thuringians, Bavarians um, also um, used them for a while. Um, and um, our main problem in this and in other um, questions is the lack of graves that can clearly be attributed to the Han warrior elite, or also to women that clearly come from the um, Asian steppes in Central Europe. So um, still, um, um, genetic approaches were tried, uh -huh. and there is um, one, I think, successful attempt uh, to come to terms with um, Xiongnu genetics, although on the basis of relatively small number of samples. Um, so um, um, this indicates, um, and you see this on the, on the colorful um, maps here, that the Xiongnu were a rather heterogeneous people. So there is not one um, sort of clear Xiongnu signature um, that um, one could then use to um, say um, that other people in other parts of Eurasia are actually descended from the Xiongnu very easily. Um, the, um, um, the genetic outfit of the European Han core groups is also not easy to assess given that um, the most um, typical funerary finds of Central Asian um, character in the Carpathian Basin are not from graves, um, but from sacrificial pits. So usually we don't even have the bones. In any case, um, there can be little doubt that the European Huns arrived from the Central Asian steppes. Um, the question um, in what relation they were to the Xiongnu um, is um, still open. Um, in 1375, in 375, sorry, the, the arrival of the Huns caused a great stir in the Pontic steppes and in southeastern Europe, displacing or subduing um, eastern and western Goths and setting off migratory movements that are now often being regarded as um, the beginning of the Great Migration. So they really arrived with a bang um, in Europe. But um, strange enough, after their initial success, um, the Huns were surprisingly <clears throat> slow to build anything like an empire. In the first decades, they obviously lived in a loose political structure. About 400 CE, the bulk of the Huns seemed to have moved westward to the middle Danube, modern Hungary, prompting the flight of several groups of barbarian warriors who had been based um, um, in this area, Vandals, for instance, or also um, some Gothic groups. But it was only during the rather short period under King Attila, and with the support of a number of subject peoples, such as the Ostrogoths and the Gepids, that the Han attacks really threatened the Eastern and eventually also the Western Empire. In the 440s, the Huns laid waste extensive stretches of the Balkan provinces. In 551, they turned westward and attacked Roman Gaul from where they withdrew after a bloody standoff in the battle at the Catalonian Plains. The following year, Attila's army marched into Italy, this time leaving the country after extensive plundering, but without encountering um, much serious military um, resistance. Why did it take almost half a century until the Huns consolidated their rule under a unified empire? Steppe empires are by no means the natural conditions of nomadic life. In fact, Attila's Huns created an agglomeration of power never seen before in the steppes along the Danube. The Sarmatians who dominated the Pontic steppes in the Hellenistic period and lived in the Eastern half of the Carpathian basin from the first to the fifth century CE, had never established a powerful empire in the way in which Hans and Avars later did. Most of what we know about the rule of Attila comes from the report by Priscus on the East Roman embassy to his residence. That was a time of intense diplomatic encounters, but it had not always been that way. 
In striking contrast to the later arrival of the Avars, the Huns do not seem to have established high-level diplomatic context um, with the Roman Empire when they arrived north of the Caucasus and the Black Sea, or soon after. It took a while under, until even names of Han rulers appear in the Roman sources. The Huns had to learn empire and skillful interaction with the Roman world. It is hard to envisage that they had kept any functional tradition of this young new art of dealing with the Chinese, so there is no strong political tradition here. Um, um, yes, um, this is where I want to go. Um, Priscus was certainly impressed by Attila and does not uh, depict him with the usual barbarian stereotypes, interestingly. The description of, Attil description of Attila's banquet and of the king's demonstrative modesty is a highlight in this narrative. Um, so um, he's not in these precious robes that the Hungarian paint, 19th century painter has um, painted him in, but he's got a simple but very clean white um, cloak, uh, as Priscus describes. Uh, but Priscus's narrative seems to indicate that even Attila had no consistent imperial strategy. Unlike the Han realms in Sogdia and Bactria that ruled over prosperous cities and trade routes, and unlike the Goths and Vandals of their day, the European Huns were not interested in conquering Roman territory and appropriating Roman infrastructure, tax system, cities, fortresses, mints, or at least farmers on their fields. Um, Attila's business with the Romans was not land, it was money. After the 447 war, he had been granted an off payment of 6,000 pounds of gold and a yearly subsidy of um, 2,100 pounds, a lot of gold. His strategy was shifting between raids and treaties that brought ever increasing tributes. But that also required progressively increasing the pressure and keeping a growing army satisfied. Um, the expeditions to Gaul in Italy in 451 and 52 indicate that the range of his strategic options under these premises were limited. They fulfilled a shared desire for military action, victories, and plunder. However, the co coherence and of this unique agglomeration of barbarian forces depended much on Attila. In 452, Attila resided for a while in the deserted imperial palace in Milan. Then the Huns returned to the Carpathian Basin laden with booty. This actually came as a surprise to the Romans and Pope Leo I was credited with having convinced Attila to turn back. In the following winter, Attila died and his realm collapsed within a year. The most disruptive element was the dynasty itself with Attila's many sons who could not agree on a successor. The subject peoples rallied behind one of the parties and ultimately used the turmoil to drive the competing Hunnic fractions out of the Carpathian Basin. Attila's sons and increasingly other Hunnic steppe peoples then lived in an unstable landscape of regional kingdoms and powers north of the Black Sea. Until their traces disappear after a few decades. But as you can see here, Attila remained a legend and a legend with many faces up to the present day. So second part is about the Avars in Europe. Um, the story of the second steppe realm along the middle Danube also begins in Central Asia. And rather neglected history, as it seems, the English version of my book about the Avars that came out in 2018 was actually the first ever monograph in English about them. And it took uh, me 20 years to find a publisher who actually wanted to publish a book about the Avars in English. While Attila built his empire in Europe, a people whom the Chinese knew as Roran ruled a steppe empire in modern Mongolia. It is likely that they were known as Avars in the steppes, although we cannot prove that. Their realm was destroyed by the Turks in 552, and it seems plausible that the Avars that appeared north of the Caucasus in 557-58 were remains of the Roran. 
However, this issue is not so straightforward and was already controversially debated by contemporaries, as we shall see. The Turks um, had lived on the, under Rohran rule and rebelled because the Rohran Kargan denied them a marriage alliance. After their victory, the Turkish ruler adopted the lofty title Kargan from the Rohran, which expressed the claim of universal rule in the steppe. In 562, the Turks destroyed the, realms of the, the realm of the Heftalites, the last of the Hunnic polities in Central Asia, and extended their zone of influence westward to the Caspian Sea and beyond. It is very likely that the appearance of the Avars in Europe was a consequence of a Turkish expansion. Here's again um, a nicely um, delineated map at a stage in which um, the Turkish Kaganate was already divided. Um, the swift Turkish expansion across la large parts of central Eurasia marks a qualitative um, change in the range and organization of steppe empires. It came in an age in which exchanges along the Silk Road had grown, not least through the activities of Sogdian traders, and contributed in turn to further intensify them. So this, arguably the sixth century was um, the um, glo little globalization before um, the first globalization whenever that happened. Buddhist, Manichaean and Syrian missionaries traveled um, far and wide, for instance. Like the Mongols after them, the Su Turks soon divided their empire and inner conflict weakened their expansive potential. Still, they kept threatening China and in 626 marched to the capital Chang'an, modern Xi'an. However, they now faced a Chinese empire recently consolidated and unified under the Tang dynasty and its astute ruler Taizong, whose counterattack soon destroyed the first Eastern Turkish Kaganet. The Turks were the first steppe people that had emerged from Inner Asia to come into contact with Eastern Rome. These lively diplomatic exchanges across great distances are related by Menander Protector. The Turks um, established um, diplomatic contacts with the Byzantines with whom they had several common interests against Persians and Avars. For instance, um, the Byzantine envoy Zemarchus traveled to Zogdia, was received by the Turks, and traveled on to the Ektag, the Golden Mountain, where he encountered Kargan Silcibulos. He accompanied the Kargan on an expedition against the Persians, um, in which they met Persian envoys at the river Talas. Um, that's here um, in um, Kyrgyzstan. Um, on, on the border to Kazakhstan, and that is the place where in 751 um, a Muslim and a Chinese army clashed. After an agreement that Byzantium concluded with the Avars in 575, the Western Turkish ruler Turksantos heavily reproached the Byzantine ambassador Valentinos, as Menander relates. The Romans would be punished for the treaty with um, the Varconitae, our slaves, he meant the Avars, um, comments um, Menander, who have fled their masters, the Turks. Turksantos, as you can see, consistently calls the Avars Varconites in, in, in this report of Varconitae. Um, if they see as much see my horse whip sent to them, they will flee to the lowest reaches of the earth and they shall perish like ants. Um, and um, that is um, quite um, consistent. Um, relying on a letter later sent by a Turkic Kargan to Constantinople, Theophilact explains how the Varshonites um, who had escaped from the Turks came to be called Avars. Although they were in fact Ogres, as uh, Theophilact claims. Now, uh, uh, going to read that whole quote. The earliest leaders of this people, the Ogres, were named Var and Khuni. From them, some parts of those nations were also accorded um, with their nomenclature being called Var and Hunin. 
Then, while the Emperor Justinian was in possession of the royal power, a small section of these Waren Shuni fled from that ancestral tribe and settled in Europe. When the Barcelt, Onogur, Sabir, and other Han peoples saw that Waren Shuni had fled to their regions, they plunged into extreme panic, since they suspected that the settlers were Avars. For this reason, they honored the fugitives with splendid gifts and supposed that they received from them security in exchange. Then after the Var and Shuni saw the well-omened beginning of their flight, they appropriated the ambassador's error and named themselves Avars. Essentially, this um, must have been information derived from the Turks, who had a good reason to deny that the European Avars were descendants of the Roran Avars. The Turks had appropriated the sublime title Kargan from the Roran. Bayan, the ruler of the European Avars, and his sons and successors also carried this title. If they were indeed descended from the ruling dynasty of the Roran, they were not slaves, but legitimate heirs of the Roran, which the Turks preferred to deny. The story about how the pseudo avars as Theophylact calls them, became Avars is an attractive example how name giving and ethnic processes in the steppes could evolve. Even contemporary authors were aware that peoples were not only defined by blood. Many modern scholars have taken this story to mean that the Avars were in reality Augurs, and so did I in my German Avar book in 1988. However, if the Turks, with some sympathy from the Byzantines, went to such lengths to deny that the Avars were in fact Avars, this could only make sense if the Avars really called themselves Avars. At least that is what I argued in the 2018 version of my book, so I changed my mind. And here, the genetic results of the Histogenes project come in, published in an article in Cell last spring. It was a pilot project in which about 60 samples, mostly from the richest graves from the seventh century in the Avar core areas were analyzed. Um, and um, this map um, shows um, sort of the historical question. What you see on the slide is a so-called PCA plot in which two principal components, PC, in which sections of the genome that are known to differ much are plotted for each individual by their relative distances to each other. They are then compared to all the small background dots which represent previously taken samples from modern and also some ancient people in Eurasia, which roughly fall into place according to a geographical map, um, west to your left and east to your right. The geneticists call that an east-west climb. The bright orange diamonds on the right in the east are the rich Ava graves, and they plot um, as far east as you can get. Only a few less wealthy inhumations um, in the Carpathian Basin point to Western Eurasia or are mixed. These are the other sort of colored symbols that you see here. And here's the simplified representation for what um, the editors of Cell call graphical abstract, which they require from everybody who submits an article. Um, so um, show a picture that tells you all about um, what you're um, trying to say. So necessarily simplified. Um, it now seems clear that an elite group of the European Avars came from the Roran Empire. Whereas Europeans already 1500 years ago were genetically rather homogeneous, the genetic difference between Eastern Asians and Europeans is quite considerable due to the large distance. This makes the case of the Avars very attractive uh, for geneticists because we can now also study what happened to these Avars from East Central Asia in Europe and to what extent they mixed um, with the local population. I would like to present some unpublished work in progress here and would ask you not to put it on social media or on the web but wait for proper publication. I would also like to add a second cautionary remark. If I speak of Avars, I am referring to the dominant group of population in the Avar Kaganet, which were consistently called Avars in contemporary text. The, this group is not identical with those whose genetic ancestry is from Eastern Asia. So um, 
there is no way in which um, we can identify these two groups. And um, I'm going to show you some reasons why. So what happened to the people with Eastern Asian ancestry in Central Europe? The, the results are quite surprising because that seems to differ considerably between individual sites. Here is a striking example, um, two cemeteries. Um, um, the, um, I haven't um, ha have the map here. Um, um, two cemeteries south of Vienna in a distance of about 20 kilometers from each other, Leoberstorf and Mödling. This is um, the Eva period cemetery at Leoberstorf. Um, Um, excavated by Falco Daim 30 years ago. Um, now, both cemeteries have substantial grave goods that allow dating them to the second half of the seventh and especially to the eighth century. They are not rich, no gold or silver, just bronze, but wealthy. The most con conspicuous objects are the cast bronze fittings of multiple belt sets worn by males, um, as you see both on the photo and on the um, drawings. Um, in the mid eighth century, the typical motifs on these belt plaques are griffins, which look very similar across the Avar settlement area, roughly between Vienna and Belgrade. Um, so uh, this is um, from the archaeological point of view as Avar as you can get. Um, also typical for late Avar period attire are the earrings um, see um, top right. Um, so now I can't use, oh yeah, so I'm here with my cursor. Um, the finds um, from the larger cemetery of Mödling look pretty similar. Here is the typical earring again, um, looks very um, almost identical and a magnificent uh, belt set, which in this case is actually um, gilt bronze cast and also um, a very nice uh, little breastplate um, with an archer drawing the bow. Um, so two Avar cemeteries, um, as the archeo archeologist would um, say, and here are the genetic results, again, plotted on the gray Eurasian East-West line. These are the colored dots. Mödling is blue and Leoberstorf is red. And that came is quite, a surprise for us. As you can see, the population of Leoberstorf um, is um, quite East Asian or at least um, sort of Central Asian, whereas that of Mödling plots almost exclusively on the Western European end of the diagram. Archaeologically, both are typical late Ava cemeteries. Genetically, they're almost as different as can be. So um, the genetic ancestry um, does not determine the cultural profile. And um, you can imagine the relief with which Pat Geary and I have um, actually taken note of that. How did that come about? Um, a second result of the genetic analysis can help to understand it. Geneticists can establish biological kinship relations from the first degree, which would be parents, children, or um, siblings, to the sixth. And if they find enough of these relations in the cemetery, reconstruct entire pedigrees. Here is one of three main pedigrees um, from the Oberstdorf. Um, only very few biologically unrelated individuals from this small rural community were buried there. Um, as you can see, none of the mothers had any ancestors on the site. They all come from elsewhere. I have marked them in red. Um, it was a strongly patrilineal and exogamous community. Female partners with Asian ancestry must therefore have been consciously selected in other places. Um, so probably not in Eastern Asia, a bit far away uh, to find a bride, um, but in other Avar sites um, where um, either um, on the basis of physical um, difference, um, or of language or of other cultural features and cultural memories. Um, these were um, supposed to be um, the right um, women to take home. 
the genetic profile must therefore be the result of a deliberate reproduction strategy at Leobersdorf. The cultural practice therefore determined the biological difference, not vice versa. Other burial communities of Asian origin um, in Hungary, for instance, acted differently in the period. Whether individuals at Mödling had distance Asian ancestry too, is a set unclear in the more than a century since the arrival of the Avars in 568, mixed marriages could easily reduce this ancestry and they have done so in other Avar period cemeteries. So if you imagine um, that um, first generation a mixed marriage produces statistically 50% um, 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 and then the next generation 25%, the next generation 12.5%, so um, four generations of um, men of um, initially Asian origin um, come down to 6.25% Asian ancestry in the fourth generation. So we are um, still um, very much used to think in male terms of male line lineages, but for the biological ancestry um, that becomes almost irrelevant if in every generation the woman is, has another ancestry. Anyway, so these are, um, I think, the very promising um, results, um, or some very promising results. Um, and of course, um, we haven't done um, these analysis on the basis of uh, most of um, the um, cemeteries um, we're studying. Um, and we're, especially once we have the pedigrees and all the relations, we can also find um, um, family biological family relations between cemeteries. We already have found um, some, so between Leobersdorf and uh, places um, in the um, Hungarian plain, for instance. Uh, and so um, that um, will allow us um, also to think more about um, internal mobility and um, um, understand much better the role of um, women in, in these um, uh, processes um, of reproduction. So um, um, the rest of the story of the Avars um, in, um, in a nutshell, um, um, unlike the Huns, the Avars had negotiated with the Byzantines from the start. So um, these um, two histories um, actually are um, quite different in a lot of respects and got yearly subsidies from the beginning under the pretext of fighting against the enemies of Rome. In 567-68, when the Longobards left Pannonia for Italy, the Avars moved from the Pontic steppes north of the Black Sea to the Carpathian Basin. In the first 20 years, they rather attacked their barbarian neighbors, barbarian neighbors than the Romans. Um, um, actually, the, the, the realm on the map um, to the right is um, bigger than I would ever put it. Um, in um, 582, after a long siege, um, they conquered the former imperial residence of Siamium in what is now um, Serbia. Um, and that was the beginning of a long series of raids into the Balkan Peninsula, often together with dependent Slavs. And in 626, the same year when the Turks marched on Chang'an, the Avars conducted a large-scale siege of Constantinople, supported by a Persian army, which, however, remained on the other side of the Bosporus. The offer for capitulation of the city that the Avars um, put forth was telling. The population without its possessions was to be deported by the Persians. They had done so in Ephesus and, um, as it now turns out, and in Antiochia, and would have done so in Constantinople. Um, the Avars were not interested in the population, they were interested in the empty city that they could then plunder. As the Huns, the Avars had no intention to rule over a late Roman and urban infrastructure. The siege failed, and as in the case of the Turks in 626, this marked the end of the expansion phase. Unlike the Huns, um, um, and unlike um, the first Turkish cabinet, the Avar polity was much more resilient and persisted for almost two centuries in a, and around its settlement area in the Carpathian Basin. I wouldn't uh, put ninth century here, um, rather eighth century. 
um, the archaeological evidence shows how the ways of life now changed. Um, in the early Ava period, the cultural plurality and wide range of connections, both to the East and to the West, dominate the archaeological record. In Pannonia, around Lake Balaton, Merovingian and Italian objects are dominant. In the princely graves of the seventh century, as in Kumbabon, Eastern material prevails. Um, these are um, individuals sampled for the genetic study um, that um, has shown their um, Eastern ancestry. Precious materials and Byzantine objects are frequent. In the eighth century, gold and silver almost disappear and the cultural idioms become rather homogeneous, as you have seen in the Leoberstorf and Mödling materials. What we also find in warrior's graves from the beginning are stirrups, which the Avars brought to Europe, not yet attested in the Han period, but in um, Tang, China, um, which um, here is a nomad um, um, warrior, um, in I think it's um, actually Tai Tsong's um, grave monument with stirrups, as you can see. One reason why the Ava elites could maintain their status was that they could continue to rely in part on dependent Slavs. Um, the Avars had mostly supported Slavic expansion, but had also profited from low status Slavic warriors um, and peasants. Ava rule was uh, later perceived as repressive by the Slav, as this picture in the Russian Ratsivil Chronicle demonstrates on the picture at the bottom where Slavic women are seen pulling a cart with an avar with a whip sitting in it. In 791, and you all know that, Charles Main laid a first well-prepared expedition against the avars without encountering any resistance, not least due to a horse pandemic that had hit the Avar cavalry and also forced the Franks to withdraw. Um, in 795-96, um, the Avar Kaganate collapsed and an army from Italy could receive the submission of the Kargan in his ring as the residence um, was called by the Franks. Seen from a Central Asian perspective, it is normal that the Avar polity disappeared soon after the defeats against the Franks. Um, it had actually subsisted for quite a while and not unusual that the Avar people vanished a little later. It was noticed in Europe as exceptional. It may be seen as a European particularity um, stepwise that Hans and Avar, Avars were both replaced by non-step peoples after the end of their empires. Unlike in many regions of Central Asia, nomadic herdsmen were not the only ones who could adapt to the ecological circumstances. From the beginning, the Avars um, coexisted with a sedentary agricultural population, and many of them um, obviously started becoming farmers at a later date. The Avars built their empire as mounted warriors, and they lost it when their famed cavalry could not respond to the Carolingian challenge anymore. Let me close with a remark on the position of the Kagan's queen, the cartoon, um, which I haven't um, uh, found um, in time um, for the book. Um, so that's an addition. Um, that seems to have changed in, since the early Ava period. The early Kagans had many wives and none of them appears um, um, in any political role in the written Byzantine sources. The poem on King Pippin's victory over the Avars in 796 describes the submission of both the Kargan and the Katun. As the Frankish army approached, the treacherous Unguimari, Germanic name, interestingly, tells the Kargan and Katune Mulieri, maledicte coniugi, that their reigns were over. Regna Vestra, Regna Vestra, twice in the plural, and that's no coincidence. It, this corresponds with the testimony of the Ochon Valley inscriptions of Bilge Kagan. You have seen a photo from the second Turkish Kaganet, which relates how the Turkic people raised my father, Elterish Kagan, and my mother, El Bilge Katun, to the throne to be above them. And uh, the Tariad inscription probably erected um, in uh, 751 
I, the heavenly born El et Mishbilge Kagan, together with El Bilge Katun, having taken the title of um, Kagan and Katun, so um, they appear in the plural um, and um, they um, share uh, in the reign. The Frankish poet was obviously well informed about this strong political role of the Katun, um, um, even though um, he obviously doesn't like her and has one of the um, subjects, Ungui Marie, damn her, maledicta conjug. Um, the Avars, who had ruled in Central Europe for almost a quarter of a millennium, had much less impact on European historical memory than Attila. Um, this um, painting is a rare exception of um, Avars um, remembered from the early 16th century, a decisive battle between Charlemagne and the Avars. This battle, of course, never happened. Still, I have hope to have convinced you that the Avars are well worth remembering. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this illuminating lecture. Um, we uh, hereby open the stage for questions. Um, I have quite a few of them if, uh, if you need some time to think. Um, so again, reminding you, if you uh, want to ask a question, send me your name um, or put it in the, in the chat. Ah, there, um, Lubova. Wait, maybe you can't. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much um, for interesting lecture. I have two questions. Uh, first, um, uh, what kind of um, contacts did the others and slaves have? Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, second, uh, is it uh, possible to trace the Hunis uh, influence in the early medieval history of Europe? Thank you. Um, um, these are very good questions and um, obviously there would be very much about um, them to say. Now, um, the Slavs um, had been um, in um, very tested um, in um, well north of the lower Danube essentially, but also on the margins of the Carpathian Basin before the Avars arrive, and they also started um, minor raids um, um, into the Balkan provinces before um, the. Avars then um, certainly subdued um, um, a lot of Slavic groups in the, at least the core area of their dominion and had um, obviously had to negotiate with Slavs um, um, in other places, um, um, sometimes with a little, applying a little pressure. Um, and um, the first interest was to um, um, get um, Slavic foot soldiers um, to join um, Avar military exhibition expeditions in a sort of um, support role. So um, the um, attested um, most um, prominently at the siege of Constantinople when um, actually the Slavs had to do all the dirty work. Um, so they were the first line of attackers under the wall badly protected, as the Byzantines also observed, and the Avar horsemen were only sort of uh, positioned in the distance, sometimes shooting their arrows um, from a distance, but usually, actually mostly um, taking care that the Slavs would not turn back. And then um, the decisive event of the siege was, um, that's also very interesting, an attack by boats uh, from the Golden Horn on Constantinople. Um, for which obviously the Slavs had had to carry um, the dugout boats, Monoxila, from somewhere. <laughs> they brought it um, with them. And so they, these were led into water and all these um, Slavs um, 
um, attacked um, from these boats and um, the Byzantines were shocked when um, after that attack had been repelled um, they found all these dead women floating in the Golden Horn so that had been Slavic um, men and women attacking in these boats so that's the, the military side of things but of course um, we also have um, um, evidence also already from the Fredegar Chronicle in the seventh century that um, Avars um, overwintered. They used to um, uh, scatter um, um, across Slavic villages um, to sort of live off um, the agricultural produce of the Slavs. Um, and um, so um, Slavs also served as. Um, sort of um, providing agricultural infrastructure um, for the um, Eva realm. And I'm sure that, um, so they comp contributed in keeping it alive um, because um, so the Avars um, still had um, these riches um, that they had um, won as booty in their expensive phase. And then um, um, they had um, people who were, would um, also supply them with agricultural products and um, foodstuffs. Um, on the other hand, of course, the Avars were interested in this kind of Ava infrastructure and they were not interested in the Roman infrastructure. So they um, had a shared interest with the Slavs um, who obviously also did not um, have any interest in maintaining any Roman infrastructure in the, um, in the um, regions where they um, lived. Um, and um, so in that sense, the Avars surely have contributed at least in speeding up the Slavicization of much of Eastern Central Europe. Um, there's still a lively debate um, about um, Slavic, um, so how um, the spread of the Slavs happened, whether that was by um, becoming Slavs or by being perceived as Slavs or whether that was actually um, a migratory movement. And um, that is something that is now very much in the focus of genetic studies, although it's very difficult because of course um, the early Slavs used to cremate their dead. So some geneticists hope that um, in, at some point we are going to be able to even analyze um, um, the genome uh, from the ashes, but I don't think that we're as far yet. Anyway, second question, trace Hunnic influence in early um, in the early Middle Ages. Now there's um, obviously very little Hunnic influence um, in the sense um, that um, people would actually have um, taken up um, Hunnic customs. Um, with the exception, of course, in um, skull, elongated skulls, which um, sort of spread um, across um, Germanic peoples um, for a while, but that disappeared um, 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 before um, the end of the fifth or the beginning of the sixth century. But um, what um, remained very much a sonic influence is the figure of Attila and um, the Huns as um, the emblem of the dangerous. Um, Eastern or Northern barbarians um, um, had had a great future. So um, they they are in so many narratives um, that um, and there is of course the figure of King Etzel in in in, in German um, um, uh, legends, the Nibelungen, the Song of the Nibelungs, etc. Um, so Attila really turned and the Huns really turned into a brand um, that um, was very successful in European cultural memory. On the one hand, as an enemy, a quintessential enemy, barbarian, but on the other hand, also, uh, it's very ambiguous, um, as somebody who would actually admire. There was even, um, I once um, gave a paper on Attila um, years ago um, in Italy, and then um, my Italian friends showed me a book um, um, in English, uh, it had been translated into Italian, the leadership secret of Attila the Hun for managers. So <laughs> we can do a lot of things with Attila. Thank you. Next we have uh, Michael Shankar. Shankar, sorry, it's here. I can, apparently I can't speak Hebrew when I, uh, when I see it. You're still on mute. 
Oh, there. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just couldn't unmute myself. Uh, so thank you very much for this very interesting presentation on one of the genetic maps that you've shown uh, the area of the aftalites was marked in gray as one of the possible origin areas. I I, I wanted to to ask what uh, what does it mean exactly? Uh, did you take samples from uh, from Afghanistan and uh, and Uzbekistan from the from the aftalite areas and uh, have you compared them with uh, with your material from uh, from Europe? And uh, if you did, then what were the the results? Thank you. Very good question. Um, now, um, so the gray dots on these maps, um, I guess you're referring to that um, PCA plot um, where um, sort of the 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 Avar graves of the seventh century are um, are marked. Um, now, um, in our project, we haven't taken haven't taken any um, Asian samples. Um, we relied on um, a set of samples from Central Asia um, that had been taken by actually the, <coughs> the main author of the um, uh, study, um, Guido Nyakiruskone, um, um, in a, for a previous uh, publication, but that was sort of um, from the Bronze Age um, to the Mongol period. But it was ancient DNA, so um, a bit better material than um, the, the modern stuff. So it's, it will be a few years, I guess, and we'll um, get rid of all um, the modern DNA samples um, for these kinds of comparisons if we have enough um, DNA um, that um, we could compare it with. The problem, of course, is that, um, I mean, perhaps also because um, there are so many interesting things um, to excavate in Central Asia, unlike the Carpathian Basin from the period, um, the ruins of palaces and um, of all sorts of um, um, religious um, buildings and funerary mon monuments and these um, sort of Chinese style graves um, with paintings on the wall, um, uh, um, um, subterranean um, chambers, etc. Um, that um, sort of the, the normal population and their skeletons are not so interesting. So we had one, one rural skeleton and it, probably a coincidence but that was the perfect fit to these avars um, in um, in the seventh century in the carpathian basin um, there is um, one problem that um, we still haven't or geneticists still haven't quite resolved which is that um, of course um the whole concept relies on the fact um, and that's been proven actually more or less everywhere that geography um, actually determines um, genetic differences. So um, people who live um, closer to each other are very likely to be also genetically closer and people who um, live at a great distance are genetically more different, um, which is in a way logical because of course um, you tend to marry people not from 1000 miles away, but from around the corner. Um, that um, may, change later, but not um, so much in our period. Um, but um, of course, um, if um, an Eastern Asian man marries a European woman, the signature that you get is um, in a way not unlike um, the signature of somebody who's sort of um, living midway between Eastern Asia and Europe. And to pick that apart, they have methods um, to try and pick that apart. Um, but uh, we're still not quite sure whether some of the kind of um, individuals marked um, in the middle of the map are actually kind of from the heftalite area or around that, as you say, or they actually sort of 50% mixed between two partners. Um, but I, I think um, they will um, soon find out also if, if we can be more precise with more samples. Oh, thank you very much. As uh, just as uh, someone who is interested in the afterlights, uh, it was interesting for me if uh, you have any evidence of genetic relations between the European Huns and uh, the Iranian Huns. Well, the Huns, Huns are so very difficult. We are lucky with Avars because we have so many sure Avars um, in the Carpathian Basin. 
Um, and we have so few um, sure Huns um, in the Carpathian Basin, um, which is also due to that um, um, habit of, um, uh, of um, not um, um, burying the dead with grave goods, but um, to have some funerary ceremony and then um, put the stuff into the sacrificial pits, which is then what you find. And we don't even know whether the dead were then um, um, burned um, or um, buried. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the Hungarians, um, there, there is sort of a group of Hungarian um, geneticists um, who essentially want to prove that the, uh, the Huns are, the Hungarians are actually descended from the Huns. So they, they try all they can to sort of um, get um, Hun genomes, um, but um, it's it's kind of um, um, the, the material still isn't enough. Um, I mean, we're, we will be trying to um, um, get something um, 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 a clearer picture on the basis of what we have, um, and um, we've um, done Ava's first actually, and we'll do um, Hans um, in the next um, couple of years. So um, I'm sure more will be coming out, and I'm hope. I don't know whether anybody does any um, genetic analysis on heftalite uh, material, which would, of course, also be interested, interesting. But um, there's probably not too many um, good um, excavated skeletons available for these um, samples. Ian Eve. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thanks so yeah. much for this, for this fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering, given the uh, geopolitical maps that you showed at the beginning of your presentation, what do you make of the very, I guess, enigmatic episode in Fredegar 71, I think, about the conflict between the Avars and the Bulgars and the, a contingent of 9,000 Bulgars coming to ask for uh, sanctuary with the Franks and what do we know about these people? Have they left any trace in the genetic, um, you know, the, the genetic finds or archaeological finds or anything you can say about this episode, really? Now, Bulgars, Bulgars are a real problem, and um, they don't really feature in our project. Um, um, but um, um, it would certainly be interesting to address it. <laughs> I mean, a they're attested um, in the Balkans. Um, even in the, in the Gothic, in the period when the Goths um, under Theodoric um, were there in the fifth century, um, so they they were around, um, and um, there are Bulgars um, attested in the Pontic steppes um, since the sixth century, and there are Bulgars attested in the Avar army. Um, now the problem is that um, um, we are not really sure what Bulgars uh, means um, in. Um, any given source, because um, in some cases, um, the Greek sources um, call people Kutrigurs, for instance, or Onogurs, and the Western sources call them Bulgars. So if you compare, for instance, the um, contemporary uh, list of peoples um, in the Pontic steppes um, by Jordanes in Latin from Constantinople and Procopius, in um, Greek from Constantinople, written at almost exactly the same time. Um, so these overlap. So um, um, obviously in Latin, um, calling somebody a Bulgar um, meant um, sort of a, a broader umbrella term then, and it was different um, um, for uh, people who wrote in Greek. So that's the first thing. Uh, then, uh, so um, it is not unlikely that the Bulgars um, that we um, that are attested um, in the Avar armies, also at the siege of Constantinople, for instance, where the same people um, whom they subdued as Kutrigurs or Utigurs um, in the Pontic steppes, according um, to contemporary reports, um, there. Um, and um, um, so, and the, and the same. Problem um, applies um, to distinguishing between different groups of Bulgars. So that there's sort of 
in, in the German um, Eva book uh, very much lends to the opinion that Bulgars um, in these sources, um, Bulgars under the Avars are kind of a, a general label for kind of second rate step warriors who were not the absolute top elite, but still um, had some prestige and, and were allowed to fight on horseback um, in Avar armies and get their share of the booty and um, were then also capable of, um, and I think that is um, a very likely event to happen, um, challenging after the um, um, failed siege of Constantinople, um, um, rebelling um, against the Avar Kagan and um, putting up their own candidate um, for a Kagan. Um, so essentially, I think um, that the Freder Fredegar report has much um, to recommend it. Um, I mean, all these details, um, the Bulgars flee to the B Bavarians, and then on the um, order of King Dagobert, they all get slaughtered at night um, in the middle of winter, um, whether that's true or not, um, but um, it's possible. Um, and whether any of what these Bulgars have, um, uh, these Bulgars have anything to do with um, the um, constitution of a Bulgar steppe empire, short-lived one under Kuvrat in the seventh century, or and or um, on the Bulgar um, um, realm being constructed in the Balkans um, under Asparuch at the end of the seventh century, is also unclear. It is um, all. Uh, not unlikely, but it's difficult, I think, to write um, a sort of clear history of the Bulgars in the period. Thank you very much. Uh, Josh Timmerman. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sahar. And uh, thank you, Professor Pohl, for this um, very, very interesting um, talk. I was struck listening to you describing your project with Professor Geary and your team. And it occurred to me that here in, in North America, um, it would be almost inconceivable to, to, um, to uh, excavate graves um, of people from 1500 years ago, which in this case would be indigenous First Nations people in North America. There would be enormous objections to this teams of mostly white scholars doing this sort of thing. I'm wondering if in your context in, in Europe, um, if on the one hand, there's any kind of ethical issues to, to weigh in terms of excavating graves and extracting ear bones, or, or if those are different in terms of perhaps nationalist, uh, uh, nationalist imperatives that, you know, what if you dig up a grave and you find that they're entirely ethnically homogenous and, and this sort of bolsters the argument of, um, you know, of ethnic purists on the, the sort of nationalist right. I'm sorry, I mean, I guess what I'm asking in a large sense is what are the sort of larger ethical, and I guess to a certain extent, political parameters framing this project? Thank you. That's a great question and, um, and, and, and a steady concern that we have, um, um, although it is very different, different from the situation in the, in the States. Um, uh, but of course, the ethics issue is there and there's the Nagoya Protocol and all these things. And um, actually, when we got um, the news that we had been funded, um, we also got um, very soon after um, a um, catalog of, I think, 12 um, critical questions from the Ethics Advisory Board of the ERC. Um, I mean, some of these questions were a bit ludicrous um, because we were also studying pathogens. Um, so, for instance, Justinianic plague. Um, so we only found one individual in the Carpathian Basin who may have had the Justinianic plague so far. And um, and the ethics um, board um, said, uh, but um, if these, um, if you isolate um, these um, pathogens uh, from the bones and then they escape from the um, laboratory, uh, then um, a pandemic could um, ensue, um, which is crazy. I mean, <laughs> these are just <laughs> very little remain of pathogen genomes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but uh, those were also questions. Um, so one was the questions, um, are you doing excavations or, um, so we're not doing any excavations that made it easier or using bones of um, communities um, sort of that um, are the ancestors of communities that still mm -hmm. um, um, 
somehow value them. And the second um, question was uh, nationalist misuse. So fortunately, there's nobody around nowadays um, who believes that there are um, AVARs, about not from the Hungarians who sort of, um, but not as a indig indigenous community, First Nation, believe that uh, the, the Hungarian nation is descended from AVARs and Hans. Um, um, but that takes you to the national nationalist um, side of the problem. So um, there are no indigenous communities around in Europe who might claim that um, these human remains are where their ancestors are. Right. Um, and and I, I wrote the 12 page ethics statement in, in which I discussed it all. Um, the nationalist misuse thing is much more um, um, much more important in the European context. And Hungary is um, one of the hotspots um, where um, they try to um, kind of um, um, also use genetics for um, um, getting a noble um, national past together. Um, and of course, um, it's always possible that um, our results will also be misused. So. Um, Maybe we shouldn't have found that the Avars actually come from Central Asia. I mean, we should have found that the Avars can come from Finland because the Finno Ugric part of the Hungarian um, ancestry and language is very unpopular with Viktor Orban and um, right, his, right. His, his group. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but um, we thought, um, so we left out um, Hungarians because um, we really didn't want um, um, to come that close. <laughs> To that mm. debate, uh, but um, um, still, um, I think we. Um, um, what I try to argue in my ethics statement is, um, if um, people can uh, misuse our results, um, um, they can uh, misuse their own results even much more. So it's better we do it than um, um, other geneticists, which who don't have a, a, a critical access um, to that. Um, are, are dealing with this stuff, and there are a few around. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks again. Um, Roger Collins. Hi, Roger. Good to hear you. <laughs> well done. Hi, Hello. You <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I was having to use a finger on the, on the computer to get myself uh, uh, as they were liberated. Um, fascinating talk, wonderful illustrations, and the genetic uh, studies sound particularly exciting. Uh, indeed, I would have thought from what you were saying, uh, they render the whole question of whether the Huns are, are descended from the Xiong Nu as, as essentially irrelevant. Um, and, and it would need to be sort of seen again very much in the light that uh, of what you were saying. Uh, my question now is just, do you think that the Avar Empire collapsed as a result of, as it were, defeat by the Franks, or is this just something that the Franks uh, uh, like to, as it were, think or to tell us, uh, and that it was rather more as a result of internal forces, i.e. Uh, failures, because I mean, there are, there are certainly accounts of um, various, for example, campaigns against the Bavarians uh, that the Avars, uh, as it were, and do not succeed. So, so that in a slightly longer term, uh, the Kayan was failing to do, uh, again, rather like what happened in the case of, of um, Attila, um, that clearly the, the Hun Empire depends upon the continuous sort of, uh, as it were, ingress of uh, tribute from various, uh, as it were, settled neighbors who the, uh, uh, if you like, who, who are the prey of, of, the, the, of the nomad empire. Uh, and that the same thing happens in the case of the Avars. Um, and that they, they last much longer. But from what we see in, in the, the sources of the, uh, as well, the late eighth century, um, that they are now starting to fail um, quite conspicuously to, as it were, uh, obtain the wherewithal to, to keep their political system in operation. Uh, I mean, I don't know what you think about that. Thank you, great question, yes. Um, and of course, um, um, to an extent, we can only speculate about that, but um, I mean, I think um, um, it is reasonable to say that actually there was not one 
Kaganet or one Avar empire, but actually two. And the first was actually the empire and the other was um, a relatively peaceful, um, if still um, um, quite respectable power in, in um, the center of Europe. And the first one um, actually relied on plunder plus tribute. Um, and the second one had to do without it or more or less without it. Um, but uh, try to preserve um, some of the political structure um, of the first Kaganet, um, um, also um, using um, all the riches that had um, been brought um, into the place um, after the raids and, and, and tributes. So there was still a lot of gold around. But at some point, they stopped putting the gold in the graves because um, there was nothing new coming up. So, uh, the, of course, the structural question is how can you ma maintain a sort of um, distinctively um, step empire type of rulership um, with um, a basically agricultural substructure and basis. Um, and of course, um, that has a dynamic um, that um, um, may fail. In that sense, the Avars are also kind of midway between the Huns and the later Hungarians, because the Hungarians actually managed that transition and managed it also with the help of um, probably um, Christianity and the church, because um, sort of um, they converted into sort of um, a normal kind of feudal Christian um, um, Central European kingdom. And the Avars um, did not manage that or did not get the chance um, to do it. Um, so, um, of course, um, I think much of the fall of the Avars can be attributed um, to that um, structural um, dynamic. And then there is, um, I just, I, I didn't know that um, when I wrote the German book, uh, but I found out um, before um, the English book um, that there was that um, um, large um, horse um, pandemic um, in the period, um, which is also tested um, in Armenia, I think, and the Caucasus region. And um, so, um, and of course, it is attested um, in the annals that write that um, the Frankish, when the Frankish army entered the Avar um, Empire or Avar realm um, in 791, and um, then they had to turn back because nine tenths of their horses had died of a disease. Um, and even if, if it wasn't nine tenths of um, their horses, it, it must have been devastating. So um, who else could have um, spread that plague but Avar horses? And so that means that the Avars were practically um, without um, horses or with um, only a fraction of their horses available. Um, they, um, their main weapon um, um, mounted um, warriors and archers simply wasn't operable. So that is the reason why they didn't even uh, try to defend um, themselves. Um, and that's also a reason. But then again, of course, I mean, um, Charles Main really invested a lot in that, um, in these campaigns and probably the construction of that canal between the Danube um, and the Main uh, River, um, which of course failed. Um, can also be seen in the context of preparations for war and here the fleet and two armies even in 791. Um, so um, that wasn't um, the easiest of enemies um, the Carolingian Empire at the height of its power. Um, it did make a difference. Thank you. Um, Irina Radkova. Um, hello. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to thank you, Professor Paul, uh, for the inspiring talk. And I have one, only one, but very particular question related to the question of Professor Collins uh, uh, regarding the, um, uh, this conflict between Franks and Evers in uh, 791. There is a historiological legend or myth that uh, uh, Franks got captured uh, uh, as a great uh, treasure of uh, Evers Kaganate uh, during uh, uh, this war and uh, 
uh, exactly this treasure they got and brought uh, from Evers uh, had helped them um, to finance their great uh, uh, period of um, um, so-called Carolingian Rene Renaissance. So uh, I would like to ask uh, you if you can agree with this uh, hist uh, historical, uh, historiographical view or can just uh, um, tell how or, uh, Eva, it was a, a completely different situation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, the answer is yes and no. Because yes, there was a formidable treasure, and that was really um, something that um, um, sort of was um, regarded as a, an exceptional um, wealth. And uh, um, Fr uh, Franks also explained that as um, this is what um, the Huns um, had always um, stolen um, from everybody, and um, their booty, the booty of Attila, which of course was not true, but um, that was really wonderful and. The, um, the gold um, um, of the Nazi and Miklos treasure, which I've some of which I've shown in the beginning, um, is just a little bit that may have been um, um, removed from the treasure before it was plundered. Um, and um, there are um, Northumbrian sources which um, talk about the treasure. And what um, Charlemagne actually did is that he um, gave presents um, all over the um, to churches and monasteries all over his kingdom and also to noblemen, but also um, to selected churches um, elsewhere in, in, in England, for instance. So this is why the Northumbrian annals um, talk about it, um, because um, part of the treasure was also sent there. And we even have um, the only part of this um, Eva treasure that we have comes from a monastery in Catalonia. So um, even there, there was a, a, that was just a little medallion that was then used um, for a book clasp and must come from the Eva treasure. <coughs> and um, so a big treasure, yes, and something that um, really certainly made um, Charlemagne's job um, easier and um, Sort of also to establish all these um, relations of gift giving um, and uh, perhaps also already preparing for becoming emperor, uh, which was a few years later. So the treasure was actually um, taken in 795, 796. So um, four years later, he was actually raised to em emperor. But um, I think um, as the Carolingian reforms and Renaissance were already well on their way and a lot of buildings had already been um, constructed and a lot of reforms put on their way. I don't think that you can explain um, the Renaissance by the treasure. So that's um, probably a connection that um, doesn't work so well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and last uh, we have Mark. Good evening. Uh, thank you for so impressive lecture. I have two questions. Uh, please, uh, it is possible to say that the Huns had some influence on the military traditions of the Germanic tribes. And, uh, uh, pardon, and uh, that new things did the Huns take over from the gods after the Defeat, defeated the state of Ermanaric. So Gothic influence on the on the Huns. Um, is that the, the question is sort of Germanic or Gothic influence on the Huns, right? Um, well, of course, there, there is a lot. Um, and um, um, of course, um, the, Goth, the Goths um, had an important role on the, at the court of Attila, um, and um, that's also um, what um, Priscus, as an eyewitness, says that Gothic is one of the languages spoken um, at, the, uh, at the court of the Huns. And um, the kings of the Ostrogoths and the Gepids and other peoples um, took part in um, Han um, 
in Han campaigns. Um, culturally, of course, um, the bulk of the finds from the Carpathian Basin from the Hunnic period is, um, well, it's um, Michel Kazansky has called it La Mode Danubienne, the Danubian uh, mode. Um, and that is a sort of um, style of these um, uh, noble warriors of um, the fifth century, um, which um, has uh, some very Germanic influences and some very Roman influences and, and a lot mm -hmm. of new ideas coming with it. Um, um, so um, these are the sort of what um, a rich warrior, um, whether he's buried in the Carpathian Basin or also along the Rhine, if he's buried with grave goods um, has, or even um, Childrick um, um, in Tournay um, in his um, splendid grave had similar objects. Um, so, of course, um, we still have that um, question mark um, whether um, or which of the people buried in the Carpathian Basin in mm -hmm. the first half of the fifth century um, were actually Huns or which ones were Goths. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there could be Huns um, who were dressed in totally kind of um, European attire and um, mm -hmm. Um, because um, we don't find sort of, um, apart from, of course, the, the arrowheads, etc., we find um, relatively little objects um, of the sort of normal um, grave goods for warriors and their wives, which are kind of Central Asian. So actually, what um, it seems that, in a general way, it seems that Huns um, were very adaptable um, to the culture of the place where they went. That's, that's quite interesting, which is also true for what we find from the Heftalites and the Kidarites and the Alchan and all these um, honey groups that um, took power in Zogdia and Bactria in northern India. So they um, used the local titles and they called um, themselves uh, Shahanshah or Devaraja. And, and um, Attila is called Rex, and we have no idea whether there was any kind of actual Hanik title behind that. Mm -hmm. But his forms of representation were kind of not um, recognized, at least as described by Priscus, were not recognizably um, sort of Central Asian or anything in, in, in many respects. Um, so, um, they adapt um, in many respects to a general warrior style, but unfortunately, they adapted um, less um, to um, a typical feature of Goths in the region, that is the grave good habit. But of course, Goths um, also abandoned that as soon as they got to Aquitaine or to Spain or um, many also to Italy. Um, so it's it's very hard to actually put cultural labels um, or ethnic labels on all these forms of cultural expression, which were more of a kind of international barbarian mm. warrior elite. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul, for this um, wonderful, wonderful lecture and the discussion. Um, excuse the couple minutes of uh, delay. Of um, please join me in uh, thanking Professor Paul once more. It was really wonderful. And um, stay tuned for the flyer for our next meeting um, in two weeks. It will take place on December 14th. So it's closed this time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shahar. Um, have a good evening. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you. Bye. Bye.